I want to know more about you growing up. Like, what was your life like? Were you a Christian, Catholic, involved man growing up, mm-hmm. family? Let's hear some of that stuff as we, we go into the arc of a pretty fascinating story we're going to get to. I'm going to give you a little teaser. Don't miss this. <laughs> that's just a command. That's just a threat. <laughs> yeah. Like that's, that is not a teaser. Just teasing. <laughs> All right, Beata Dudes, we are back in studio today for a Rip Roar and Monday show. We're excited to have you here. The Beata Dudes is a show and a movement for Christian men looking to walk towards the Lord with one another in authentic fraternity. And you know what? It's working. And so you're going to be on a roller coaster with us today as we welcome our guests. But first, let's welcome ourselves. <laughs> I'm going to start with myself. Welcome Jeff Shufflebine to the show. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Gosh, I love this place. Yay. I'm wearing a yellow YCP Young Catholic Professionals t-shirt that I just got from their new swag store. I'm really enjoying it. Nice. Comfort colors. Guess what else? We sell the same kind of shirts in our store. So check out the Beatitudes. Like, Dot subscribe, com. and buy. Right? <laughs> Nailed it. Working on it. Okay. And then uh, I also am pleased to welcome to the show Nicholas Besner. What's up? What's up? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Excited to be here. Uh, Monday. Here we go. If you had a walk up song for Ooh. getting on a microphone, what would it be? Mm, wow. So, first thing that came to mind was Back in Black. But. Bow, that, bow. Yeah. Bow, bow, bow. <laughs> but that was. That was just because... That sounded like the cartoon dog version. <laughs> <laughs> but that was just because it was actually our walkout song for our high school football team because mm. our colors were black and white because priests wore black and white. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're from Lindsay, Texas. Correct. Where everybody's Catholic. Yeah. So back in black. Back in black. Okay. I'm glad to be back. And now the the voice you're hearing right there, I'm pleased to welcome to the show, Paul Colker. Hello, I am rocking uh, a Beatitude shirt, as one does on one's own podcast, uh, wearing our own merch. What's interesting, though, is you can't buy that one online, but you could buy one off of Paul right now for how much? Let's start the bidding at $5,000. Put him in the comments. <laughs> I Highest would, bidder gets it. I will authentically game worn jersey. Yes, brother, that's right. If they do Signed. that, I'll film us taking it off of you. <laughs> do, do I get any say in the matter? That makes the price and, actually go up if and, you don't get a say. And I'll sign it. <laughs> sign by Nick Besner. All right, let's see what happens. The guy who ripped it off and mailed it. I'm really glad I set the price so high. <laughs> Um, That's just a starting bid. We'll see where it goes from there. Touche. Yeah, thank Touché. you for funding the show, Paul. And your walk-up song would be? Um, uh, why can't we be friends? <laughs> why can't we be friends? Why can't we be friends? Yeah. Yeah. Right on, man. Uh, I have your so vain stuck in my head. And I'm not trying to be funny when I said it. It's in my head all day, every day. That's my walk-up song right now. I don't know what she says there, but anyways... <laughs> All right, and we're going to welcome to the show our true guest for today, Bill Kula. Welcome. Thank you. Be yeah. dudes. Yeah. Awesome to be here. Glad to have you here. Uh, is your real name William? Only when I was in trouble when yeah. I was little. William. Yeah. William Kula. William Ricardo Kula, get your butt downstairs now. There it is. Man, William Ricardo Kula sounds like a guy who's either going to beat you up or lead you astray. <laughs> <laughs> But you turned out all right. It turned out okay. Your your initials spell work. Work. They do. I've noticed that over the years. <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah. That's that's wild. Man, that, I don't know why, but I can never do initials. Oh, hard. that's the first place my brain goes is W. It's mnemonic devices. Yeah, I don't know. That's what I do. Bill, what is your relationship to each of the Beatitudes? Let's just start there. You're, you're here nice and close to the mic. Um, what, how, did, how did we all connect with you? First through through you, Jeff. So I work at the Catholic Foundation, uh, whoop, which, whoop. which is uh, we are the longest <laughs> yeah. serving community found Catholic community foundation in the nation. Wow! Uh, coming up on our seventieth anniversary. Wow. So there, I do every imaginable thing related to communications, PR, and marketing. My friends say, well, "What do you do? You used to work at in corporate Verizon for twenty years, just across the street." Mm-hmm. I say, "I do everything." that I did there, but in a different tone because I'm reaching a different audience. So I met you, Jeff, uh, 
through your support as uh, uh, as a as a trustee, and that's how I got to know Nick through the relationship with you, and then with Paul. Paul is one of our esteemed former Hal T. Han Scholarship winners, and uh, every year a uh, rising senior, so when they're still a junior, receives a, a wonderful scholarship, and we recognize that student when we're honoring uh, the best of Catholic philanthropy, which we'll do uh, in February of this uh, of next year. So that's how I've gotten to know all three of you. And um, Paul, you already finished your junior year. Um, I'm st- I'm still working on it. <laughs> Very good, but good. I can't wait for that scholarship to kick in. You know, it was a special <laughs> moment. You took you, you interviewed Paul for y'all's magazine. I sure did. I got to interview Paul. I interviewed a few other uh, former. Hal Tehan scholarship winners. I learned a whole lot about Paul in that call. Uh, and it's just so cool. I love storytelling. Um, but what that allows to be a good storyteller, you have to be a good listener. So mm-hmm. I got to listen to a little bit of everything about Paul's life and um, was able to uh, have that one of our previous uh, publications. And a lot of people were saying, that's what Paul's doing. And uh, recently put a call into his brother for a work-related uh, question uh, with him being the um, chaplain out at the SMU. Oh, yeah. his brother, brother father. Brother yeah, father. My brother father. Yeah, yeah. and um, Paul, am I mistaken if I am to say, like, this is an awkward moment. Are you performing at the upcoming retreat for the Catholic Foundation trustees? Yeah. Yeah, we're doing well. <laughs> you have a heck of an agent with all these deals you've been getting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I don't pay him nearly enough. <laughs> um, he even takes pictures of you that end up in articles that Bill writes. <laughs> that is accurate. That's true. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> People are like, why, why are you taking so many pictures of him? Well, I bought his house. I try to take pictures of him everywhere I go. <laughs> to be clear, you didn't buy it from me. <laughs> so it's not like I benefited from that. Dude, you've been busy rocking the the improv. Yeah, yeah. There's been a lot going on. It's been wild. It's awesome. It's been a, it's been a blessing. So. Don't you leave this tiny table. I well, I mean, I won't right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not just be here when we schedule recordings. Yeah, I'm not just, just going to get up and walk <laughs> off. Oh, sorry. I have to go perform. I mean, I'm going to go think about all the upcoming performances. Uh, Bill, have you ever done improv before? I have never done improv. No. Yeah, you seem like one of these guys that's willing to like go out there and like just learn new traits. I I I, I would do karaoke, I would do improv, um, might swim a backstroke uh, down the down the Trinity, the, the Trinity River, if need, <laughs> if need be. You're an if need be kind of guy. Yeah, I can tell. Sure, I love it. Um, how? Uh, well, actually, let me go way back here. Um, I want to know more about you growing up. Like, what was your life like? Were you a Christian, Catholic, involved man growing up? Mm-hmm. Family. Let's hear some of that stuff as we we go into the arc of a pretty fascinating story. We're going to get to. I'm going to give you a little teaser. Don't miss this. <laughs> that's just a command. That's just a threat. <laughs> yeah. Like that's that is not a teaser. <laughs> just teasing. <laughs> and Bill. That that's short of get out of the boat. That's short of there. So <laughs> I'm in the youngest cousin of both sides of my family. Um I have a milestone birthday coming up next month and uh causes my older brother and my older sister say so we are getting older mm. um so 40? I, well add 20 <laughs> so i grew up in el paso texas where i was born i'm a product of a polish father and a hispanic mother uh we had the strangest yet coolest foods on our dinner table every night growing up my dad was with at&t uh his whole life uh and we would talk about Ma Bell. And I kept wondering when Ma was going to come to the (laughs) table because that's all I would hear about is Ma Bell. And I pictured her wearing a brown bonnet and a brown dress. She never came to dinner. But that's what prompted my father to move from El Paso to uh, the Dallas area. And so that allowed us, because one of the things I'll talk about is how he instilled in me the love of baseball, but it ties in with faith. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up the product of of, uh, two very devout, Catholic parents who who raised us to be good citizens first, and they taught us to do our very best in anything that we did. And so I lived a pretty 
leave it to beaver lifestyle without a lot mm. of chaos, a lot of without a lot of disruption. And as I moved into my um, teen years, I was heavily influenced by the deacon at our church of St. Pius X in East Dallas. And in it, it bewilders me as an adult to think that I was actually a teenager who asked my parents, so when is Deacon Landrigan giving a homily this weekend? Because I want to be there. Mm. And it was because of the stories that he told. And so thank God a year before he passed away, I invited him to dinner, met him at the uh, uh, pastoral office for the diocese and just simply said, thank you, Deacon, because cool. you may not have known it, but for the last 40 years, You've been walking alongside of me. He was the reason why I chose journalism as my profession and got my degree in journalism and have worked in marketing and public relations my entire career. And it's humbling that now our oldest daughter is following in my wife's and my footsteps doing the exact same thing. So very traditional, leave it to beaver lifestyle. I went to public high school. And what was cool about going to CCD all those years is that my two closest friends were Catholic. They went to the same parish as us. And in high school, we were told, or people were told, if you have any questions about being Catholic or what it means to be Catholic, ask Julie, ask Shalice, or ask Bill. That's a lot of pressure in high school. (laughs) So I felt like I became a young apologist without even knowing what an apologist meant. Oh. Wow. For those of us who aren't so sure, what does apologist <laughs> mean? Well, mostly in high school, I had to debunk a lot of myths and a lot of fictitious arguments and reasons why so many of my Protestant friends said, oh, you're Catholic, you know, you're not normal, or Catholics don't go to heaven, or you pray uh, you you worship saints. Uh, you you uh, you have this strange relationship with with Mary. What's going on? Um, so you weren't apologizing. No, for being. I Catholic. was doing the exact opposite. <laughs> yes. I was expressing joy in being a Catholic Christian. And in high school, I often did say that I didn't just say Catholic. I said I'm a Catholic Christian, so that my non-Catholic friends knew, hey, we're all Christian. We believe in Christ, and we may have slightly different differences um, when it comes to, say, sacraments and sacramental moments. So I was never apologetic of being a Catholic, and quite honestly, I didn't know until I was about 18 years of age that when we moved into our neighborhood that many people in the neighborhood didn't want to talk to my parents because they found out pretty early on that we were Catholic. Mm -hmm. And the only Catholics that lived within, I'm going to say, several hundred yards were the O'Reilly family of seven who lived right behind us. And we got along swimmingly. And he was my first soccer coach. And so we got along with them. I just didn't realize that being Catholic wasn't always the, the... you weren't received as well by some of your neighbors. I didn't know that till I was 18 years of age. And so as an adult, all of that early questioning and, and, and wonderment that people had about what does it mean to be Catholic has helped, helped me to be a better um, disciple, and not just a disciple, but a joyful disciple yeah. to help people know, hey, we, we are so much alike. So I want to unify people. I want people to appreciate the joy that's found in Christ in the workplace and in our volunteer time and in our, our goof-off uh, time. And so I think that there's, there's a path that was given to me and presented to me that I didn't know at the time, but it has allowed me as an adult to be uh, now an adult apologist and to help people understand um, what it takes to grow in their faith and that why people of different Christian religions can come together. And, and I had a, I met a man not too long ago who's Muslim, and, and I had dinner with him on Monday night at a uh, Pakistani restaurant. And when we left after a three-hour conversation, there were still 100 people in that, that Pakistani restaurant eating and we had a beautiful conversation talking about uh, Muslim and Catholic religions mm-hmm. together. I wouldn't have been able to do that before had it not been the upbringing that I was given. And, 
you know, every good parent has a wonderful parent before them. I had awesome grandparents. Beautiful. My Hispanic grandmother lived to 99. I track after her in so many ways. So she and my mom are really uh, spiritual rocks, spiritual rocks. And I go visit her at Calvary Hill Cemetery because she lived with my parents for the last 10 years of her life. And she instilled in me the power of prayer. Yeah. I owe that to, as we say in the Hispanic culture, abuelita. She was little. She was five foot tall. And so she was my short little grandma. But she instilled in me the power of prayer by witnessing what she was doing. And even in bad times, she always said uh, memo, which is short for Billy in Spanish. She taught me of the importance of prayer. And, and fortunately, I listened. Memo. Memo. Hmm. This is fascinating. Um, can you, <laughs> you hooked me with one thing in there that I want to know. What's a description of something you would eat that was both uh, Polish and Hispanic on the same plate? <laughs> a perogalata? <laughs> <laughs> perogalata. I don't know if such a thing exists. Um, <laughs> it may be that um, we had stewed uh, cabbage with beef wrapped in it, which is called a guamki, uh, which is a little bit Polish and Czech. But there, we, my mother would throw in a little bit of Mexican by adding in some um, chops up of serrano. I was going to say serrano. Uh, serrano yeah, peppers. this is awesome. So we had a little bit Polish, a little bit Mexican on their dinner table. And then friends would sleep over at our house. They, they always would come back saying, wow, you got to go over to Billy, Billy, Billy's house because they eat really cool foods. And <laughs> I didn't appreciate it at the time, but I certainly do now. That's incredible. Wow. Uh, okay, so Billy. That's how you get William Ricardo. Like yeah, Billy. William Ricardo, <laughs> Billy, Mimo. Mm-hmm. We got a lot of things going on here, buddy. Um, <laughs> let's talk uh, at whatever speed you want to fast forward to. How long have you been married? Wendy and I have been married 30 years. Wendy Darling. Wendy Darling. I met Wendy when she was 19 years old. Did y'all go flying together? No. Oh, I just was thinking of Wendy Darling. No, like no, we did the, not. Wendy you're did. the Polish Mexican Peter, Peter Pan. Pan. <laughs> um, um, oh, I mean Pietro Pano. <laughs> right. We met. Uh, we met as um, college students. We met on the campus of SMU. Mm. We met under a uh, canopy of an oak tree that's still there. We go visit it every year uh, at our anniversary. And what's really cool about where we met is it was so impactful that one day I decided to walk off the steps from this oak tree to Perkins Chapel. And so I started walking. I got around 336, 37. Oh, my God, where am I? I I marched all the way back, and I counted my steps deliberately. One, two, three. I got to 539, and I was at the altar of Perkins Chapel, and that's where Wendy and I got married, 539 steps from where we met, and back then, now Bishop Duca, Father Duca, was head of the SMU Catholic Campus Ministries. And I think he agreed to marry us after uh, I confirmed for him, yes, Father, we met 539 steps from where we would like to exchange vows and express our love for each other. And I said, but neither of us went to SMU. Is that okay? And he said, you counted you counted, tw- you counted twice. He says, I would love to marry you. <laughs> so that's, uh, it's, a, it's just a really cool thing that that's we... That's the power of storytelling. Yeah, we, I love that. So yeah. we, celebrate, um, we celebrate our anniversary. And then we, um, we weren't selfish. We deliberately chose not to have children right away because we wanted to just enjoy life together. Well, in hindsight, I, I would probably have liked to have even more children because I didn't realize the the beauty of being a a dad. Um, But as the good Lord unfolded for us, we're the parents of two daughters. Uh, One will be marrying uh, the love of her life next April Mm -hmm. uh, at my mom's church, uh, St. Jude in Allen. And my father is interred in the columbarium uh, right behind the, um, the altar. And that's the reason they chose St. Jude to get married. Because when I said, why there and not our church in Plano, Prince of Peace, that's got a wonderful new worship space. And she kind of dipped her head down. And then she looked at me and she just said in that one word, grandpa. 
Oh. No, I'm not crying. I, I just have allergies. So I was just at St. Jude last week, and I got chills because I was in the sanctuary picturing mm. what it would be like. And then our youngest daughter is a, a senior at the University of Oklahoma, Boomer, and so she's going to soon be um, graduating, and she'll come back to the Dallas area to pursue her master's. So I love being a dad of daughters. I think I probably would have been a bad dad if I had a son because um, I would have gotten frustrated or I would have pushed them so hard in sports. But uh, being a husband and a dad, that's, my, that's job one. Yeah, that's vocation. job one for me. You know, I would love to see – you said it's next April when they get married. That's right. Can you figure out how many steps it is from that tree? <laughs> uh, that's going to be a lot of steps. That's going to be a heck of a toast by the dad. <laughs> 173,000. Yeah, but whatever it is. Um, and then I also, I forgot to mention this, but uh, we do something special anytime one of our guests has a name like yours, like Kula. And every time you say cool, uh, the Beatitudes out there either get a point, have to eat um, an Oreo cookie and put <laughs> toothpaste on it. I mean, it's some nice. sort of a weird game that nice. um, I'm trying to think of what you would do. I, I don't want it to be a drinking game. That would be too much. He said cool like 30 times. Mm. Um, oh. Yeah, you have to... Um, I put toothpaste on an Oreo. <laughs> re retrieve a non-alcoholic beverage from a cooler. Yes. Nice. So it's a cooler. It's a cooler. Um, hey, I got something cooler for you. Nice. Uh, Nick's going to tell you what it is. Okay. <laughs> the game is Blessed Are the Joke Makers, for they shall inherit the points. 539 points. That's right. We're going big time. Whoa. I love nice. it. Winner, one, winner. One point. I got this in the bag. I've been, a, I've been sandbagging. <laughs> All right. In the, for the, 163 <laughs> episodes. <laughs> All right. The way this is going to work is we've got a character card and a Catholic card game card. We have to answer the prompt on the Catholic card game card as this character and you just get to decide it's not it's not like who did it best it's just which one did you like and you have to give them all the points mm. okay big one all right five, step by step 539 points all right the character that we have to become <laughs> is somebody who is irrationally fearful or highly phobic it says in parentheses and the prompt is priests think about blank in their free time uh, in their free time priests are always afraid that minivans are going to break down on the way to practice for the big game and 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 they're trying to figure out like how how, how, how will i ever tell the coach and 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 and, and what's going to happen to to, to, my, to my car and so um i have to go get the right auto parts at oh 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 riley soccer coach <laughs> not bad i think i blew a snot bubble <laughs> not bad i'm just going back to his hometown i we're with you i don't know if he is or is it i wasn't with me in in their free time, um, priests, uh, well, they they think about the the number of germs that are are present just all over. I mean, because you think about the number of kids who are blowing snot bubbles, and uh, <laughs> and really the fathers of those kids who are blowing <laughs> snot bubbles, and and how how they're being juggled, and uh, just smearing things all over the place, and and then of course, uh, and he had probably thinks about like the purificator, which is used. In the liturgy, but why is the cloth called the purificator when it's the blood of Christ that makes us pure? And it just doesn't make doesn't make any sense. So, uh, you know, it's just the the, the, the germs. <laughs> well, you know, in in their in their free time, priests priests are always you know talking with their talking with their their congregation and they're they're meeting people at the after their confession they're always thinking about them and, and thinking you know you know if, if somebody is is going to follow the same career path as their father but then but then work for a rival company you know how, who who is who is the better telecom giant and 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 whether whether or not like will want will good prevail in the end and and maybe maybe bill will actually work for the catholic foundation <laughs> <laughs> Priests think about that all the time. All the time. There's a lot of points. There are a lot of points. Yeah. <laughs> and you, um, you can't divide. Okay. 
I'm going to say it's it's not about you, Jeff. It's not. It's <laughs> not about you, ah. Nick. But I'm going to have to go with uh, Father Son um, Paul with the win uh, because it was uh, germ germ germically. Uh, it was Germanic. It was Germanic. <laughs> um, Germane. And I comes. and I enjoyed the uh, the story about the, uh, the 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 germs and the, the purific purificator. throwing purificator Amazing. into. A, I knew he had it. I, was, there was, you, I had you no got, shot. You, you had me at he purificator. He threw purificator in, and I was like, um, nah. And I'm <laughs> and when Jeff talked about minivans, I was trying to picture what's a minivan in it, you know in this era, sort of versus. Yeah. But there probably are minivans out there, so no offense to that, yeah. no offense to the <laughs> telecom giants. So I'm going to go with uh, 539 points. Go to Paul. Congratulations. <laughs> Enjoy this dance, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. This has been the end of season Thank four you. of the Beatitudes. <laughs> <laughs> Come back We've next week for the beginning of season no five. <laughs> We're just going to keep going more points every time. Double it. Double it again. Double, double. double it again. Hit me. <laughs> Hit me. Hit me. <laughs> Peter, you're at 21. Hit me. <laughs> uh, man, well, congratulations to Paul Thank and you. to Mr. Kula uh, for being our celebrity guest judge. You're going to get Our Lady of Lord socks from SockReligious.com. If you threw a slash after what I just said and then wrote the word Beatitudes, you could get 10% off. Awesome. First, though, you should Thank like, you. subscribe, comment, share, and think about the Beatitudes a lot. <laughs> like, comment, share, subscribe. And then go to SockReligious.com slash Beatitudes for a discount. Um, we'll be right back at Lucid Private Office after these commercial breaks. One break. One break. Multiple commercials. The team at Aquinas Wealth Advisors believes that good values and good returns are not mutually exclusive. Using a tech-smart and morally sound approach, they provide investment alternatives that align with Catholic teachings without sacrificing returns. These days, faith-driven investors are finding it hard to know where their money is going. They have no visibility into what their dollars are supporting, but there's a better way. Thanks to the faith and finance score from Aquinas Wealth Advisors, you can look into your current holdings to see what you're supporting and make a switch to an advisor that aligns with your values and gives power to your voice. Check out AquinasWealth.com today. Hey Beatitudes, it's Jeff here. When Nick and I set out and we started this company, Undivided Life, we decided to not use traditional healthcare, but we went with Solidarity HealthShare because we thought it was an affordable and ethical alternative that matched the needs of our business and our growing families. Since then, my family put Solidarity to the test. We've had pregnancies, babies, emergency room visits, even a brain surgery for one of my children, and Solidarity has been an incredible partner and has also had the cost and the ethical approach that we love. Here's a link for you to go check it out. LearnMore.SolidarityHealthShare.org slash Beatitudes. This is your chance to be in solidarity with the Shufflebine family. Hi, it's Paul Kolker from the Beatitudes here, and I just wanted to share with you guys that I also, outside of the show, perform improv comedy on a regular basis with a group called Divine Comedy. So what we do is we come up with everything on the spot, so whether you're looking for faith-filled, fun, family-friendly comedy for your youth night, or whether you're looking for clean comedy for your corporate event, Divine Comedy can perform for your group and even get you in on the action. So if you'd like to hire us to come out and perform for your next event, check out Divine Comedy Improv. Com. Divine Comedy, an inferno of fun. Stop what you're doing and listen to the Beatitudes. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're just going to jump straight to it here. Uh, there's something, I think, big that happened a few years ago that we should probably dive into. To here, the though. world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. And also to Bill. Yep. So here we are in September 2024. Uh, in the spring of 2021, um, I almost died. And I received the greatest grace in my life, next to all the sacramental moments of being baptized and the early uh, entrances to the, to the Catholic faith and being married. But the grace that saved me was the ability to literally be transported so that I could visually see people where they were at that moment in time praying for me while I was in a hospital bed. 
And also when I was in ICU for eight and a half days, intubated. So I um, got the dreaded virus, uh, COVID. It was shortly after my wife got it, and then our youngest daughter had it. And at the time, it was all brought on because uh, everybody remembers um, the ice Mogeddon in February of 2021. Mm-hmm. We, like a lot of people, countless pipes burst upstairs, and so it flooded the, the front part of our house. And it was no longer hospitable for us to live because as the remodeling renovation company came in, they were blowing all of 20 years worth at the time of dirt and grime from the garage into the house. Gosh. So I went upstairs just to justify and prove a point to the insurance adjuster, and his name was David. So I wrote, hello, David, on this screen of our TV upstairs to prove a point of how much dust was in our house. <laughs> and when I sent that photo to him, he said, I got it. This is a really bad case. So we had to move out of our house, and we were in a nearby hotel. And uh, shortly after, my wife came down with COVID, and she uh, was staying in the hotel room. She did not need to be hospitalized, but she was on medication. Um, I developed covid and, and just had the most overwhelming feeling of my life where I just got run over by a Mack truck. Mm. And I just fell over. I was, I was typing an article that I had been writing, and I just got so exhausted that I literally just fell over onto the couch, and I laid there for probably two hours. Mm. Uh, the, and I went to sleep, and I woke up. My temperature was through the roof, and I said, it. I, I guess I contracted this. So um, when I started having to take such short breaths like a, like a panting dog, <laughs> I told my wife, I said, I, I just can't catch a breath. So she knew better. She called Plano uh, 911, and the same crew from Station 13 uh, came banging at my door and said, Mr. Kula, we need to come in, and, and we're here to help you. And I knew the voice of who was shouting, and it was uh, Captain Anderson, who is a fighting Texas Aggie uh, himself. And I knew that voice because when the Ice Mageddon happened, he came, well, he and the rest of the crew were at our house because we had a small fire in front of our house that we didn't even know about at the time. But we had placed uh, all of the, you know, the tr- the, 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 the area where you have... Uh, uh, the, the lights were shining up. We, we put, um, uh, what do you call it, like towels and some other wrappings around mm-hmm. it so that the, that the water sprinkler wouldn't freeze. But it was too close to the light that fell over in the wind, and it caused a fire that went up 16 feet high, singed the front part of our house black. And so when we noticed that the next day, Captain Anderson and team came and checked for hot spots and said, everything's clear. And he said, but man, I got to tell you, this could have been a very different ending because the fire started sometime in the middle of the night. I know what I went out there at midnight to wrap the pipes. So sometime between 12 and probably 6 a.m. is when the fire happened. So we, we developed a relationship. House with the, fire. House fire. Burst pipes. Burst hotel. pipes. Hotel. Hotel. Virus. Virus. I go to Bill. my doctor. I go to my primary Dust. care doctor and say, I'm just not feeling you know, very well. This was before I went back to the hotel and was on some medicine. And my doctor said, okay, you developed asthma from all of the dust particles blowing in your house. Real? I just need you to stay away from anything smoky. So the very first hotel we stayed at, uh, we were in the same room. Um, my youngest daughter and wife were off watching a TV show at some friend's house, and the lights started blinking, and the alarm started going off. And I said, this has got to be a joke. And then they kept going. I said, this has got to be a joke. So I grab our small dog, and I open the hallway door. I can't see the end of the hallway because the hotel we were in was on fire. Six doors down. No way. And so I grab all of our materials that were important to us, go out to the car, send a photo to my wife and daughter and say, the hotel is on fire. (laughs) And my doctor's saying, stay away from smoke. And I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. So it was so smoky, we had to check out the next day into a different hotel. And that's where I contracted the COVID. 
Um, so fast forwarding to that time frame, uh, Station 13, Plano Fire, we view them as our, as our superheroes in human flesh. Uh, they, they open the door, they check my, my uh, blood oxygen level, and they said, okay, it's 72. I didn't know what that meant. They said, 72, this is a serious situation. We need to transport you for treatment at the hospital. So I'm wheeled on a gurney. And I'm waving to my wife and my daughter that's looking out the hallway. Little did we know that that potentially could have been the last time they ever saw me. So I get to the hospital and um, I'm on my phone like a communicator would. I'm telling people, oh, I'm probably going to be out of here in three days. Well, things turn sour very, very quickly. And um, I, I wear contacts and glasses. I didn't have my glasses on. But there were five different white coats that were in the room, and I knew that probably wasn't good that so many doctors were in my room. And they said, uh, Mr. Kula, we're transporting you to intensive care. All I knew is that intensive care meant that's bad. <laughs> so off I go to intensive care, and I am the type of patient that wants to know what's going on. So when the nurses would leave the room, I would sneak a peek and I would move my hand on the machine that was on wheels to the left of me. And I saw the blood oxygen reading and it was at 50, 5 oh. And I said, I, I know this is probably not, not good at all. And so the doctors were, you know, I was intubated. It was tough to talk. It was very tough to breathe. Uh, I couldn't eat any food. And so I began to just say, well, where do I go when, goodness, this calamity is happening to you? Because you're missing your wife, you're missing your kids, you're missing your family. I didn't have my phone with me, so I was alone by myself until I realized you're not alone. Mm. Jesus is in the room with you. So that's the beauty of, I think, my story of, of why I'm still here on earth and was given a second chance to live is that I started praying, you know, Lord, just, just watch over me. And I said, just keep me safe and help exalt me back to improved health. So one night I was, um, I remember this extremely cold presence coming over me. The room was freezing cold and that show Dateline was on in the room. And it was that gentleman who has a very deep voice. To this day, I do not watch that show because it reminds me of what the turning point was. So I hear his deep voice coming on. And, and I look up, and up above me are two panels. On the panel on the left is this, is this mucky, black, tar substance of which I've never seen before in my life. There were witches on sticks. There were goblins. There were the most gory, horrid images that you could possibly imagine. And screaming, and, and, and yes, literally gnashing of teeth. And I'm like, oh, my God. And then on the right was this most beautiful image I'd ever seen, colors I've never seen before, um, angelic sounds, uh, waterfalls, flowers, beautiful clouds, and the presence of peace. And so they were side by side. And I looked at that, and I'm thinking, what does this mean? And so I turned to Scripture, and, and I said, Satan... In, internally, I said that because I really couldn't talk with the, with the tube in my throat. I said, Satan, get behind me. I am a child of God. I am not yours. So I prayed on that and prayed on that. And then suddenly that image disappeared. And before me was a strong presence of Jesus himself holding a strong bill, not a weak bill. I was muscular. I was strong. I wasn't sick. I could breathe. And he was holding me in his arms. And I hear the Lord's voice say to me, you are mine. You are mine. And I'm like, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I see these beautiful colors. And, and he says, there, Jesus is saying, I've got people praying for you. And then that's where this amazing grace that happened is these, these 
little colorful balls started to appear before me. And I could see colleagues from work, colleagues from um, I've known since sixth grade, my family members, neighbors, people in different organizations in these pop-up color balls that I said I've never seen before. It's I'm physically now in their kitchen. I'm at their church. I'm in their car. I'm in their classroom. People are praying for me. I hear them saying, Bill, hey, brother, we've got you. You're going to be okay. Um, just stick with us. You know, the Lord's got you. And, and all sorts of wonderful prayers. And then one of the prayers that really stood out was that of my mother. And I hear my mom's voice saying, Jesus, take care of my son. Over and over, Jesus, take care of my son. And more importantly, she's in the corner of this of this part of her room next to this picture of the Blessed Mother who is kind of weeping, and she's next to the Garden of Gethsemane. And I'll tell why that's significant in just a second, because I, I, I was just praying and praying so hard. A nurse comes in. She says, Mr. Kula, why are you smiling so much? Because she's looking at the number that said 50, blood oxygen. She says, why are you smiling so much? And I could barely talk, but in my scratchy voice, I said, you know, ma'am, and I won't use scratchy voice, but I said, ma'am, if you only knew how many thousands of people were praying for me, if they were doing that for you, you would be smiling too. And I said, because the Lord's got this situation, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be getting out of this room. And she's looking at me as if, uh, I don't know what you know, but I'm looking at these numbers and they don't look really good. Um, the mm -hmm. doctors did place a call to my family one night and said, we're just really not sure what else we can do for Bill. And uh, it's just not looking really good. So that night, I just kept peering in and, and listening to all those prayers that were that were coming into me. And when I saw that image of Christ holding me up and saying, you're going to be OK, you're a child of God. I knew that was the turning point. Uh, the theme here is faith over fear. I could have been scared. I, I, I was scared. We're all human. Let's get real. I was scared to death, but I, I, I longed for life. And it was that longing for life that overcame the fear of death. And Christ just, you know, my favorite verse is John 16, 33, when he talks about, you know, in the world there will be trouble. And, and, but I have overcome death. And I just kept focusing in on God's got this, God's got this, stick with it. And, and the next morning when I woke up, I see the blood oxygen had already gotten into the 60s. Fast forward, it started getting up into the 70s. And in the room, they're saying, this is amazing. We don't know how this is all happening. Lots of medicine was being pumped into me, but even more prayers were being poured into me. Mm -hmm. And so I know this to be true because when I had the reunion with my parents and here's the key of this is not a fictitious vision that I had or hallucinations I say hey mom when I was in ICU there was this particular prayer that I heard you saying specifically Jesus take care oh I did not say that I said there was a prayer that you had over me and there was a particular place where you were. And I said, I'm not going to tell you what that is. I want to hear it from you. And she says, well, sure. She says, son, she says, I was in the corner of our bedroom. I was next to this picture, you know, that one that your grandmother gave to me with Mary praying for her son next to the Garden of Gethsemane. And I just kept praying over and over again, Jesus, take care of my son. And I say, mom. Let me tell you what I heard in the hospital. <laughs> we cried and cried and cried. And then we smiled and smiled and smiled. Thank God for the power of prayer. Thank God for the power of intercession. Because I guarantee you, when you pray for somebody else, it, it magnifies their need. It provides comfort to the lonely. It brings people back from the brink of death. And I was given a second chance on life. And there's so many more now amazing things that have happened that tell me that God is so present in my life. And I just, I am so grateful for all those prayers that rolled in 
because again, medicine, no disrespect to the medical industry. My brother is a doctor and I was talking to him on a chest plate of doctors who were taking care of me. And he just kept saying, Bill, he said, keep your chin up, keep your chin up. And when he said, keep your chin up, it reminded me of something that my father who fought in World War II on Iwo Jima, that he always said, I said, dad, how did you survive everything in Iwo Jima and the foxholes? And he said, son, we prayed a lot. And he said, we always kept our chin up. Mm. And when my brother was telling me, keep the chin up, I'm thinking, I'm going to take you literally and I'm going to take you figuratively. And I kept thinking, you know, even my father who's passed away um, uh, a few years later, that he was involved in that prayer support with my mom because I literally kept my chin up and it helped me physically in my body, but it also helped me to focus on the people who instilled in me the faith that I have to turn to Christ in that moment of despair as opposed to succumb to, you know, the, 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 the awful evil imagery that was presented. So I really do feel like I've been shown the two choices that we have in life. And I guarantee you, you do not want to choose hell. It is the most vicious, awful, gruel, gruesome place you could ever imagine in your life. But then when you picture what heaven will be like, it's nothing like we've experienced on earth. And it's where we all want to be when our body leaves this planet. You know, um, something that came to mind as you were sharing all of that, I've been reading, um, I I tried to read it years ago when he first published it, and I I don't remember what happened, I got distracted, whatever, ADD, something, but um, but I'm almost done with it, I I reread the first part that I got through originally, Um, it's Jesus of Nazareth by um, Pope Benedict XVI, and one of the things he emphasizes is, um, or, or one of the things he calls out, I should say, is that a lot of people wanted Jesus to be the person who fed them just bread, right? Like, take care of the physical needs, take care of of that part, the, the kind of the bodily part of our, our humanity. Um, he said, but no, but he wanted to give them more than that because humanity can't be reduced to just the material human being there's a spiritual dimension there's a there's a whole component there and so as you're as you're saying all this it's reminding me of you know we we often think of good corporal works of mercy like oh i need to donate money to to my church or I need to donate money to St. Vincent de Paul or, or I need to show up and actually serve in a soup kitchen or whatever it is. But praying is a spiritual work of mercy. So there's the corporal works, the bodily works of mercy and the spiritual works of mercy. And you, you got a, uh, a full fledged or full immersion baptism into the experience of what's going on mm. on that spiritual work of mercy, that spiritual side that, that sometimes we we forget about i think in our you know kind of scientific not scientific but like our hyper scientific way of thinking about everything that oh i've got to be able to measure everything and it's it's not exactly like that there's there's so much more going on than meets the eye that's that's incredible bill when you saw the two panels you know we had you on the radio and i that show moved me just like this one does and I think God made you a storyteller so that you could tell this story. When you saw this image of the darkness of maybe it's a glimpse of hell, I mean, you, you know or feel something that I can't understand. Did it cause you fear? Do you have fear if you like you have flashbacks to this moment? Is it fear? I have in the last year, I have actually had more. Uh, revisits of that moment in time, which mm. which itself scares me at times. And sure. I'm thinking, why am I seeing that again? But it's almost like a reset where the Lord is saying, I'm just here. I'm still with you. I'm still holding you. 
Um, you know, my pulmonologist, I never had one before I had COVID, um, wonderful woman. And she refers to me as her greatest success story. Mm. I love that. Mm. And I have told her I have prayed for you so much. And I just give so much um, gratitude for the work that you personally did, because she was the lead person, if you will, on the case. And so when I do have these visions of that dark, black, gooey um, concoction, it always comes with the other panel of the beauty and the joy and the peacefulness. I don't see just one at the same time. It's always as if it's like a choice. And so I feel like it's a recalibration, almost as if the Lord is saying, I, I'm still with you. You're on a journey, Bill. Mm. You've been given a second chance at life. So what will you do with that? Mm. And my ministry, I believe, has come. I want to be the person in that neon, amazing, psychedelic, colored bulb that's praying for other people. Yeah, I was at the very hospital. Goodness gracious. I was at the very hospital where I almost died last night. I was just taking a meal for eight people because it's the grandpa of my future son-in-law. He may pass away today, the grandpa, and he may pass away in a few days. But having visited with he and his wife for, you know, the last several months, taking them the Blessed Sacrament on the weekend has been so beautiful because when I go visit him at different um, rehabilitation facilities or hospitals— I'm walking down long hallways, and if you've ever walked down a long corridor late at night, particularly on a Sunday, you'll see a lot of older people just staring into space. They're not looking really at anything. They're not talking to anyone. And I just, I, I, as I walk past the room, I'm just saying, Lord, be with this individual, be with this individual, be with that person, be with them. Give them hope. Give them the faith to choose you over the other option. And I, I, I have just become this firm believer that, that the power of intercessory prayer is just one of the greatest gifts that you could give to anyone, whether it's, it's, it's a, a, a prayer that you have silently or it's a prayer that you extend to them in person. Um, but prayers are answered. God listens to us. And I think that that's been one of the greatest blessings that I've had in life is that when things happen, I know they don't just happen by coincidences. I know that God has his reign and his providence, and he's, he's so wrapped around all of us. He's there for the, invi the invitation. His grace is free. It's there for the choosing. And so I, I just do think that um, when I am presented those images— it's almost as if it's a, it's a sanity check to say, okay, how are you doing? Where, where are you in your life? Are you praying for your family? Are you taking care of your family and other people? Or have you s slipped and slid away? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not scared by seeing that. I'm more uplifted because I know that you know Christ has been with me so present at the darkest hour of my life to the fact that he's here now and allows me to share my story and hopefully it causes people to choose faith over fear when negative or bad things come into their life. I think I just, the goofiness in me um, couldn't help when you're Please. saying you're, you're going around to people and like praying, Lord be with this person. And it's just like, you get a prayer. You get a prayer. Yeah, yes. You're, you're a Hoprah. <laughs> Hoprah. Thank you. Thank you. That's Bada pretty bing. cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I like that. You know, it's funny listening to your story. This is not me being funny. You made me think about the act of contrition in a way that I've never had to mm. grapple with, which is I fear the loss of heaven and the pangs of hell. I fear the loss of heaven. This rolls off my tongue and it kind of makes sense to me, but the other one doesn't. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't try to contextualize that. I just say those words. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like looking at these panels and you're like, well, hey, dude, which one of these? Yeah. You kind of fear both that you might not get this one and that you might end up at this yes. one. And, you know, to have a contrite heart and to, to stay in the sacraments, maybe you've been given the greatest gift, which is, you know, 
a regular checkup, a regular reminder to go through your checkup. Yes, <laughs> you know? yes, yeah. your exactly. sacraments and your love for others. Like, if you have a bad day at work or you're in traffic, like, what does that look like now after this experience? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the mundane. It, yeah. It, yeah, the 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 old bill, if you will, was you know uh, honk the horn. I, I, I might have shot the bird at somebody. I'm blinking my bright lights as if that's going to cause something to change mm. about their spirit. And, and I do what my father does, for starters, every time I pass a, a ambulance, right, um, I do the sign of the cross and I pray for the person who's in need. I pray for the first responders. I pray for the family involved. I pray for the medical team. I do that when the um, care flight flies over our house. I just feel so called to give back mm. to people in prayer because of the magnitude and the volume of prayer that was infused in me. Have you ever watched the Beatitudes before? I have many, many times. Right answer. Next question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, uh, we have a, an episode from our first season with Jason Shanks, who underwent a coma and many near-death moments from his experience with COVID. And um, have you ever met Mr. Shanks? I have not. Okay, well, I know we're going to talk about some of this stuff related to the men's conferences and different stuff. I know he's going to be coming in town. Y'all have to get together. Yeah. Like, yeah, to I happen. just want to yeah. like get out of the room and let the Holy Spirit work through the two, two of you. Beautiful. Because hearing these stories, you know, they're not similar, but you both, I think, belong somehow in the same room because you're both, you were both given multiple gifts, including the gift of the cross that you bared and your families both bared yes. in the near losses that you had. Um, I want to throw a curveball at you. We talked about what the bonus show might be. Mm -hmm. You um, you have a very close relationship with the game of baseball. Yes, I do. And um, if I could throw a teaser, watch Friday's episode. <laughs> um, maybe we could turn that into a baseball-themed episode because I think there's something that the good people of the Beatitudes world need to hear. I, I do. So you want me to wait to tell that story? I do. Wait till Friday. Okay, I will. <laughs> Bill, um, I don't know. How would you? How would you kind of close out uh, a, an opportunity like this, either in prayer, or encouragement, in reflection, with your your situation, with what your family went through, with what they must experience, with, with you know, even your mother coming to terms with the fact that you watched her pray for you mm -hmm. when you were away behind closed doors alone in a hospital. I don't mm -hmm. know. What would you, your kind of final thoughts here be for us? I, I, I would strongly encourage people to um, recognize that whether your prayer is out loud, whether it's in the form of a song, whether it's something you write, or if it's a quiet prayer, that Christ has the ability to take your need, your request, and advance that to other individuals to make it present upon their conscience. I don't know where this falls within faith, where this falls within mysticism, where this falls within science, but there is this ability to, to, to move in time and space that God has that power, and, and not that he's giving us necessarily all of us that power, but when we are given that grace, to know what other people are saying about us, or in this case, pray about us, to, to, to rely on that, to know that in the worst possible moment of your life, that there are legions of people who are praying for you, even people you don't know, because I strongly believe that the saints and those who have gone before us who are in heaven, they are in tune, they know what we're praying, they have the ability to have a multiplicity of screens, so to speak, on life and what's happening, and they're able to direct their energy and their prayer so that the prayers, that when we're praying for souls to be purified and move from purgatory to go to heaven, it's reciprocal. And the saints that have gone before us, they love praying for us. Not just your patron saint, who I wear around my neck, St. Matthew, not just the patron saints of your children's, St. Sarah, St. Teresa de Avila, who I wear around my neck, the, 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 the Blessed Mother, and most importantly, the crucifix that I wear around my neck. 
when when one of the nurses came in and said, we need you to take that necklace off. And I said, hold on, that's not a necklace. That in my quote was, that's my cornerstone. And it's staying on as long as I'm here. And it's never come off. It stays with me. And so we don't have symbols. We Symbols serve as a reminder. And that's why I think those panels that I see are much like, in a way, sacramentals sounds weird, but it's reminding me to stay focused, stay on track, don't give up hope, always keep praying for other people because um, you never know the influence that your prayer uh, is going to have. So those colorful neon psychedelic, uh, I am so grateful for everyone who prayed for me. All I want to encourage people to do is is give back through prayer because you you just don't you can never underestimate the power of prayer and what it's going to do to exalt people back to a proper better solution than the one that they might be in. Bill Kula, Beatitudes, a prayer warrior. Bill, you remind I, me of the saying. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say like I feel like just a I don't know challenge is the wrong word, but just like resolution. Like, go for it. Go call your mom or your dad or somebody that you know has ever prayed for you and just love on them. Can I throw one on top of it that's an old adage? When somebody's in need, pray it, don't say it. Yeah. You ever heard that one? Mm. Yeah. Pray it, don't say it. Did you just did you just make it up? Yeah, it's old. It's like <laughs> it's an old adage. It's now like twelve seconds. I've heard Jeff say that before. <laughs> yeah, just a little while ago. Um, but, but no, there's actually a, stop and pray. That's don't exactly say it. Don't say I'll pray for you. Yeah. Pray. Pray it. <laughs> Don't say it. Yeah. Priest's been saying that since this episode came out. Um, yeah, I love the resolutions. Call your mom. Call everybody who's ever prayed for you. Well, good luck with that one, Bill. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Pick one. Start T- there. Just tell them to watch the Beatitudes. They'll get the thank you here. Yeah. Uh, but no, start with one. And um, geez, the power of prayer, brother. You're living it. And uh, we are too. So, Amen. Amen. We'll, uh, we'll keep on praying. Until the next time, we will. See you in the Eucharist. Pray it up, folks. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to join us at our undersized table, subscribe to the video version of the show on YouTube by typing at, that's the symbol at, so shift and two on your keyboard, at the underscore Beatitudes on YouTube. We'll see you there.